so uh, recently I have been asked by patients and providers why I have preference using hypochlorous acids uh, over the sodium hypochlorite solution. For those who know me from before, uh, you know I'm not uh, fond of memorizing brand names, but for the sake of better understanding of our topic today, uh, when we say hypochlorous acid solution, we are referring to uh, the BASH uh, wound solution as an example. And when we say uh, sodium hypochlorite, we are referring to the brand name, uh, like brand names like the Anisept or the Dakin solution. And um, um, for those of you who may have worked in the past watching this, uh, you could attest that I had used Anisept as a cleansing agent. Um, I tell you right now that as an evidence-based clinician, it is okay to change our mind. Science is an evolving process and uh, we, uh, when we follow science, our patients will win the battle. That's my humble opinion. So like what I said earlier, it is not my intention to promote one product and put down the other product. We are all educated clinicians here and we have free will to choose what is the best for our patient. If after watching this uh, video, uh, your preference is still going to be different from mine, that is okay. In a democracy, uh, uh, we have a free market uh, place of ideas. So as long as your heart is for the interest of the patient, then I suggest that we should still kind of be good friends. There are so many truths though, okay? Your truth, my truth, uh, his truth, her truth. But as long as the truth is evidence-based, let's bring them on on the discussion table. We should not forget that um, we as clinicians, uh, we should imagine ourselves standing, forming a circle and the patient is at the center of that circle and we are all looking at the patient not to its other okay so wound care indeed is a team approach and the approach should be evidence-based so it has a solid foundation that should boil down to great clinical outcomes so my primary goal for goals for this lecture is to describe the biochemical differences between the two solutions and uh, i will tell you why i choose one from the other and uh, Let's review the current evidence in practice regarding this topic and then I will make my summary and recommendation. So this is an example of an order. So it says cleanse wound on the left lower leg with taken solutions every dressing change. And uh, it also specifies the pregnancy with its leg three times a day. And also it says may use anisept uh, as a substitute. Actually, it looks like it's uh, it's a good order to me, like the way it's written, because it has the location of the wound, it has the specific brand, or specific product to use, and it also has a frequency, and also it stipulates or specifies the substitute uh, product, just in case the taken solution is not there. But if, in your opinion as a clinician, you think the taken solution is not the, the order that you're going to pick, so uh, do you think that this, this is a bad order? You're going to label this as a bad order? In my opinion, it's not necessarily a bad order, but in my opinion, there, will there be a better product or will there be a better uh, order I mean yes to, to be used to the patient so if you think so um, you should equip yourself with good reasons then label this as um, a questionable order for you and then communicate that to the prescriber in your communication you have to make sure that you are respectful uh, you should be scientific factual and you should establish an evidence-based argument not anecdotal uh, let's um, stop the cycle most of the time, the prescriber may not be updated. Wound care is especially of its own. So how would a physician know everything, right? If the approach is right, if the communication approach is right, I believe that the response will be right as well. So um, make the patient win, not you or the doctor in this uh, type of situation. By the way, I've been talking a lot about evidence-based practice already. So what does evidence-based practice mean to you? So I don't intend to lecture on a two-semester uh, course in uh, evidence-based practice, but I just wanted to make sure that we are on the same page when we say evidence-based practice. I can tell you right now that as an evidence-based clinician, you should provide care that is grounded in scientific research. It should be guided by clinical expertise and ultimately directed by the patient's individual values and circumstances. So it's like a triangle. So what um, what is your expert opinion about this uh, this thing? What will be a good treatment for this? What uh, does the textbook or the expert uh, are saying about it? So you're going to elevate it uh, higher and say, so what is the scientific research are saying in vitro, in vivo, ex vivo, 
it's gonna stop and after that you're gonna bring it like this is the patient now what are the unique patient circumstances what are you looking at the patient what are the characteristics of the wound what are the comorbidities for the patient what would the patient like okay so or what are the patient choices so you have to put all those together and uh, in that way you're now an evidence-based clinician um, uh, basically speaking okay so if you google a question and an article uh, pops out to your rescue um, do you know how to appraise the paper Okay, don't believe everything because don't believe everything that you should be able to appraise the literature that you're reading okay so now how is this applicable to uh, to um to what we're discussing right now so um our words are gold to our patients so if we um if the evidence is clear that one intervention is better than the other we need to share this to our patients colleagues and also the prescribers uh, this enhance the quality and credibility of our services so if we think this way the patient will enjoy the best clinical outcome the interventions that we were doing yesterday may not be necessarily wrong but the question is that like what i said earlier is there a better and most efficacious and most efficient way in treating this patient or like is there a better product so we must choose right we must choose in the real world we find ourselves like taking a multiple choice examination uh, when we're confronted with a uh, unique patient circumstances and uh, there are so many options that we can do for the patients and these options are actually good options however we must like an ex take an, a taking a, an exam it's like a multiple choice exa exam so um what is the best choice what is the best uh, intervention for this patient okay so let's go further so in this slide, you would see the structure, the chemical structure of uh, BASH um, versus the structure of the anisep or the Dakin solution. So if you would note that, of course, you have the chloride, you have the oxygen and the hydrogen. For the sodium hypochlorite, you would notice that it's now deprotonated. Okay, so, um, and they're both inorganic compounds. And uh, this is the chemical formula for both. Uh, this is the hypochlorous acid and sodium hypochlorous. What I want you to remember, Okay, is the pH. Always remember that for the hypochlorous acid or the VASH solution, the pH is between 5 and 6, and for the sodium hypochlorite, it's a lot higher on uh, the alkaline side. Okay, so it's uh, actually between 10 and 13. So now you would, uh, uh, I, I'm going to make a, a lot of emphasis on the importance of the pH in wound healing as we go on with the discussion. Anyway, um, <clears throat> if you're a clinician or if you're a patient, which one do you prefer a product that has a milder odor or a product that has strong odor when i was still using nsf at that time that was before the pandemic uh, we don't have a lot of uh, n95 at that time i'm, I'm just using the uh, regular uh, face mask and it it's the, the the face mask is not actually enough for to, to shield me from the strong odor of the anisept anyway um side effect wise uh, there's a great body of evidence um, that uh, hypochlorous acid is actually non-toxic, it's non-irritating. And like what I said, for the anisep in the Dakin solution, uh, one of the side effects is people get nauseous and it's, they're also irritating to the skin and the eyes. Um, in fact, uh, the label says keep away from the children and you have to use it in well-ventilated areas. And the hypochlorous acid, it's safe if ingested. If you accidentally ingest it, they're saying it's safe in small amount. So then I will tell you why later uh, as we go on to the next slide. So uh, stay with me and uh, uh, we, ha we have a lot of uh, great things to talk about, okay? So if you're a physician or a nurse watching this, let me just take you back to the sweet memories of your biochemistry class. Uh, however, if you're a therapist uh, watching this, uh, please follow me as you may have not encountered this biochemistry pathway during your formal education. Um, what is happening during the acute phase of inflammation or during the acute inflammatory phase of uh, wound healing? So you heard about phagocytosis, correct? You know that the um, uh, goal of the acute inflammatory phase is to debride the wound, to uh, eliminate bacteria, to prevent infection. So uh, phagocytosis must happen not only during the acute inflammatory phase of wound healing. This is happening every single time when the immune system recognizes a foreign invader. 
So let's talk about phagocytosis. So um, it starts with the recognition and attachment of invading bacteria to neutrophils or the macrophages. So um, it, the, um, the bacteria, bacteria needs to be recognized first and uh, by the immune system. Just like me, you can recognize me by, uh, by uh, just listening to my foreign accent. You know that English is not my native language. Right. So um, now, uh, after uh, the recognition, uh, the bacteria will be attached to the neutrophils and to the macrophages. And then um, the bacterium is being engulfed through the process. We call it endocytosis. It will now be incorporated into phagosome, then into phagolysosome. OK, Here, let me see if I can use my pointer. So that is the bacter bacterium there, and it's being recognized and it's attached to the membrane to a ligand mechanism, and then it will be engulfed through the process of endocytosis, and then it will now be incorporated into phagosome and internalized into what we call the phagolysosomes with the attachment to lysosome. Okay. Now, um, after this, the molecular oxygen readily available in the surrounding is will now be converted into superoxide to the action of this very important enzyme we call it we call it the NAD pH oxidase this conversion from uh, of molecular oxygen is robust uh, to um, uh, peroxide and we call it the respiratory burst this is very important uh, while in fact uh, there is a genetic uh, condition when people cannot express this um, enzyme the deficiency and the NAD pH oxidase causes a lot of problem and it's been our discussion for today anyway after the, uh, the production of superoxide superoxide the superoxide will now be converted into hydrogen peroxide uh, spontaneously or to the action of an enzyme we call it the um, superoxide dismutase so it's this is dismutated into peroxide now follow me here okay in the presence of chloride and through the action of this enzyme, my yellow peroxidase, this is actually, actually a lysosomal enzyme, uh, the hydrogen peroxide now will be converted into hypochlorous acid. Okay, now, boom. We, uh, you now um, know that hypochlorous acid is naturally produced by our immune system to kill bacteria. This is a very powerful or very potent bacterial killer. Okay, so now that is the um, oxidative uh, or oxygen-dependent pathway uh, of bacteria killing in the body. By the way, let me mention that um, during this process, um, the environment here is acidic. The pH is low because the protons are being pumped into the membrane of the phagosome so that there will be more uh, production of uh, hypochlorous acid because you need a lot of oxygen to produce hypochlorous acid okay so that's it so oh by the way uh, let me just go ahead and uh, summarize here so let me see if this is your okay let's see if this is your molecular oxygen available okay it will be uh, converted in, into a superoxide um, species and then this is through the action of uh, your NAD pH P H oxidase is an enzyme, okay? Oxidase. All right. Oh, I am having difficulty writing this. And then um, this superoxide will be converted into peroxide. All right. Into peroxide. And to the this one will be converted into hypochlorous acid. Um to the action of the enzyme my yellow peroxidase in the presence of chloride okay now that's how we produce this very potent bacterial killer in the body we, we call it hypochlorous acid all right so um let's keep going so the next mechanism is the oxygen independent pathway here um the killing is through enzymatic activity so remember that uh, all you need to do here is to have a hostile environment for this enzyme to work. So there are numerous of them, but my favorite is the lysozyme. So uh, you need a low pH, and in fact, um, the phagolysosome pH uh, drops to between 4 and 5, uh, this being the optimal 
pH for the action of these enzymes. So the take home lesson uh, for these two pathways is that uh, the oxygen dependent mechanism in killing bacteria uh, produce, uh, produces uh, hypochlorous acid which is a very powerful uh, bacterial killer. And the other arm is the enzymatic arm. All you need to do is to have a hostile or low pH environment and these enzymes will be activated and uh, the bacteria could be killed. So let's keep moving on. So at this point, please remember that there are four overlapping phases of wound healing. First is the hemostasis, followed by the inflammatory phase, the proliferative phase, um, and the remodeling phase. So um, now if this is intact skin, uh, you'd know that the pH okay, at the surface of the skin is 5.5 and below is 7.4. Now, um, uh, the normal skin with intact keratinized epidermis, like what I said, has a pH of 5. 5.5 and this is due to the secretion of the sweat in the sebaceous glands and also the presence of fatty acid and other proteins okay the so after uh, the clot formation or after the clot is formed due to the disruption of arterial and venous supply um, this uh, reduces the oxygen um, supply in the wound environment so uh, this remember that the purpose of the hemostasis phase is to uh, to produce the clot and also to prevent further bleeding. So there is a massive vasoconstriction. So what happens there is that uh, there is decrease in the oxygen um, supply in the wound environment that would uh, lead uh, the uh, shift from an aerobic metabolism into anaerobic metabolism that will lead to the buildup of uh, lactic acid. And uh, this buildup of lactic acid reduces the pH uh, of the wound into six. This is actually the initial wound fluid pH. So let me just write it down. It's six. Okay. Now that's the initial um, uh, pH of the wound fluid. Now in the inflammatory phase, the neutrophils and macrophages generate reactive oxygen species. Okay. I already showed you the pathway earlier. There's a production of uh, hydrogen peroxide and of hypochlorous acid. And this lowers the wound fluid to a pH of 5. So it's more acidic. Okay, so let me just write that down. 5. Let's see. There you go. Now, in the proliferative phase of healing, um, the vascular endothelial cells generate new capillaries. So remember that there will, there will be now a, a process of angiogenesis. There's a granulation tissue formation. There is a proliferation of the, of the fibroblasts. There's a migration of the fibroblasts into the wound matrix. And there is a, a production or a making of a new collagen. And also, in fact, is some of this collagen differentiate into what we call myofibroblasts that is responsible for the wound contraction. Um, this together increase the wound fluid into seven. Okay, so the pH now will become more on the neutral side okay now um the as the healing progresses uh remember that uh, especially if this is a full thickness wound okay the uh, the uh, the uh, uh what you call is the hair follicles are no longer there so uh, your body will be uh, relying on the adjacent intact skin Okay, and especially the basal layer of the adjacent intact skin and in the balls region of the hair follicles uh, they will grow rapidly and produce these epithelial cells and these epithelial cells will migrate into the new scar matrix to resurface the matrix okay so this together helps return the pH to 5.5 so um, 5.5 so studies had shown actually that uh, a full healed wound has an epidermis a pH of 5.5 and a repaired dermis of 7.4. Okay, so uh, let's keep moving on. So this, oh, by the way, before we leave this slide, that is the, uh, I just showed you how uh, pH uh, changes during the different phases of healing. Okay, and then you know that this, okay, in this phase, okay, um, the pH must drop in order for uh, bacterial cleaning or phagocyte, not phagocytosis, uh, for um, the, the, the final phase of, um, uh, of uh, bacterial killing could happen either through an oxygen, oxygen dependent or an oxygen dependent mechanisms. 
So why is it extremely important to have a balanced pH uh, on uh, the acidic side? Um, resident uh, bacteria, the resident bacterial flora remain attached and preserved to the skin if you have a normal pH which is on the acidic side. Okay, when the pH is, let me see, pointer. So when the pH is disrupted and becomes alkaline, okay, what happens? See here? Uh, this allows the dispersal of bacteria from the skin and growth of pathogenic bacteria. So this allows entry okay, and contamination of acute wounds. So if you have uh, acute surgical wounds, um, the disruption of the pH actually allows the entry of bacteria that would um, contaminate the wound that could lead to colonization and, of course, impaired healing. So, on the side note, remember that all wounds are contaminated, but they would heal. When they are critically colonized, even though there's no sign and symptoms of infection, sometimes this wound will not show any sign of healing because they are critically colonized. Now, it is reported in the literature that bacterial colonization may contribute to the shift toward an alkaline pH and the pathogenic bacteria has preference to grow at a high pH environment. So that is the importance of having an acidic mantle okay, versus the alkaline skin environment. The reason why the bacteria cannot penetrate, cannot attack, cannot enter the skin because it's maintained by a pH that is more on the acidic side. And once the pH is disrupted, this would allow the penetration or the entry of this bacteria or the dispersal of the bacteria, um, the resident flora of the skin, and um, they would allow the growth of pathogens. And uh, this uh, bacteria, bacterial metabolism, would also increase the alkalinity of the environment that further encourage the growth of other pathogenic bacteria. It is extremely important that we have an acidic mantle on the skin versus an alkaline skin environment. Okay?